Hello, and welcome to Tangier Island is Sinking, a conversation with the playwright. This conversation is presented as part of Mason Arts at Home Digital Series. For the next couple of weeks, we will continue to bring you concerts, conversations, films, student performances, and everything in between, straight to your homes. Now, we believe that the arts create community. And while we can't gather together physically, we can at least come together digitally. But today's conversation is with School of Theater alumnus, playwright, and grant recipient, Zachary Wilcox. Zach is the recipient of one of our CVPA alumni grants for his play, Tangier Island is Sinking. And just a side note here, these grants uh, can still be applied to for the next two weeks for any young alumni listening. The Alumni Artist Support Initiative is a new funding source created in the wake of COVID-19 to help support our alumni artists who have suffered financial losses due to canceled or postponed performances, exhibitions, and freelance opportunities. And we will link the information about this resource in the comments section of Facebook. So, Zach, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. So. I want to start by having you just tell uh, our viewers a little bit about yourself. When did you graduate from Mason and what are you up to now? Sure. I graduated uh, from George Mason in 2015 um, with a BA in theater, um, uh, concentrations in performance and playwriting and dramaturgy. So sort of wanted to do a bit of all of those things. Um, and uh, for a few years, I just worked as a, um, a teaching artist and administrator for um, acting for young people in Fairfax, Virginia. And then I also um, was just a working actor and playwright uh, and ended up starting a theater collective called Who, What, Where Theater Collective um, with a few people who you're about to see. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, now I'm studying for my master's of fine arts in writing for stage and broadcast media at uh, the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in London. So right now I'm five hours ahead of everyone um, in my early evening. So <laughs> All right. it's really great to be here. Good for you. So you were the recipient of this grant. Um, tell me what the, the first thing, uh, or maybe this is part of the application process you did about um, your intention of how you were going to spend this, uh, this funding uh, towards the creation of this project that you had in mind. Well, um, Luckily, I already sort of had uh, a first, like a first stab at this, uh, at this subject, um, because I, uh, in like 2016, 2017, um, there was a playwriting competition coming up for a one act, and I just had this idea to write about Tangier from, from the past, and um, later, uh, um, I found out about this opportunity, obviously. Um, for the alum, uh, Young Alumni Project. And I just thought that I could take that one act and expand it. Um, and uh, Rebecca was a huge fan of that idea. You'll see her in a few minutes. And uh, she sort of um, really encouraged me to go for this. And so I, I just wrote up a quick, um, basically proposal for this project, uh, including focusing on the, the media attention that the island has received, focusing on the uh, the dialect and the culture of the island that that is, you know, theoretically threatened by climate change and by um, uh, it just yeah the the way that uh, the digital age is sort of encroaching on on our culture as as a society. So I just really wanted to explore those things, and um, that was where I sort of started this uh, process from. So the inspiration for Tangier Island being the subject matter for you began earlier on than when this grant came along. Was there any uh, inspirational moment or something that brought your attention to that particular location or that particular situation? Um, well, I mean, when I was, I think in high school is probably when I first, heard, or maybe middle school or high school is when I first heard about the island. Um, it's a local island-ish and it's a, it's off the coast of where I grew up. Um, and um, yeah, it was sort of known as this like very interesting, mysterious, like unique place. And um, where I grew up is already sort of unique and isolated. So it was, it was like an extreme version of that. I was just really interested in that. Um, but then 
uh, there was a phone call between the president and the mayor of the island in 2016 or 2017, which I think got some media attention. I, and I, I just saw a post on Facebook and was like, wow, that's, that's a play. So, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and that moment has made its way into your script. Uh, as well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I want to bring Rebecca Walls into this conversation as well. Um, Rebecca uh, has been working with you in terms of the actual process. Hi, Rebecca. How are Hi. you? I'm doing well. <laughs> and you are also part of the Who, What, Where Theater Collective. That's uh, right. And so, um, I want to talk to both of you about the um, the process that you went through in order to the, begin the creation of, of this script. I know that you both went to Tangier Island. Uh, tell us about uh, what you planned to do when you got there and what preparation you had to do in terms of setting up in interviews or conversations. Run with yeah. that. <laughs> sure. Um, well, uh, with the proposal, we sort of uh, we came up with a budget, which Rebecca was very helpful with, and sort of just thought about you know if we're going to this island, obviously we need to think about some essentials like where we're going to stay and food and all that stuff. Um, but then uh, then we obviously sort of focusing in on um, interviewing people and just how the heck you do that because <laughs> I, I definitely had didn't have any experience in um, interviewing and. Um, I'm not sure how much Rebecca did, but we we got a lot of help with that and did some practicing before we left. Yeah, um, and, I think yeah. we were really lucky in that sense that um, uh, there's a, a DC theater artist named Mel Carter, who uh, she's an actor and um, creator, and she saw a previous show of Who What Wears and heard our you know spiel about the fact that we were going to Tangier at that show, and she approached me and was like, I want to be a part of this. I love interviewing people. She was a national player with Olney um, and traveled the entire country performing three different um, plays for a year, which is what that program is. Um, and she gave herself a project on that tour, which was to interview one person in every town they visited. And these are primarily more rural towns, towns that don't have access to theater. Um, mm -hmm. So she had great practice in exactly what we were about to do. Um, so she took us out on the National Mall in DC for a day and like made us be brave <laughs> and um, approach strangers and ask if we could ask them some questions about their lives. And yeah, with a focus on, and Zach, please chime in if I forget some of these things, but like a focus on community, traditions from their homes, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and was there, um, are there playwrights or theater companies beyond uh, the young lady you just mentioned that inspired this particular um, construct of this script, the, the reality-based, interview-based um, creation? Uh, well, definitely, yeah. I, um, I was very lucky to early on in my sort of like conceptualizing of, of the play to receive uh, a copy of Moment Work, which is a, a book um, by Moises Kaufman and the the Tectonic Theater Project, and it was given to me by Mary Lecter. So thank you for that. Um, and um, I read through that and uh, was just reading about creating new work uh, and creating work with communities um, to to ultimately present something about a people or a community, a location. And and it was just uh, if I didn't have that that framework i think for how to approach this type of um this type of like issue social based work i don't think i would have been able to <laughs> to get as far as i have with the script or with the story so far and it's it's been a, a really big beast of a story because there's so much to include and yeah um yeah, we, yeah. one and of the oh sorry go ahead kevin no go right ahead oh i was just gonna say that um so we we spent five nights, I think, on Tangier in the end. Is that right, Zach? I believe it was five, um, four yeah. or five. Um, and I mean, it was like not long enough. It was an incredible experience. Um, and I think we were all, as we were leaving, we were like, when can we come back? Um, <laughs> yeah. But one of the things that we did um, each night was an exercise from Moment Work. Um, uh, that was just kind of the way that we would like end our work for the day before we transitioned into, you know, not working for a night. Cause like it was a group of five of us all staying in an Airbnb. The one of two Airbnbs, is that right, Zach? One Only of two, two. Yeah. <laughs> One of two Airbnbs on this island where everything is dark when the sun goes down. It's a dry <laughs> island. There's no, you know, discernible nightlife, right? So we're just in our house 
And we knew we had to set a way for us to like stop being at work and transition to just like, you know, <laughs> being at night. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we would end the day by doing moments um, based on a process from the book. So uh, any moment that stuck out to us from the day, we would, um, you know, oh, I have one, remember? And then you basically just creatively set up um, the action of that moment. Um, and the point is to use things other than just dialogue to tell stories. So like we would get really creative with, oh, and Mel was so good at this, um, you know, pulling down <laughs> lamps to create lighting and like, how do you create sound effects? At one point, I remember I made like 20 paper cats yes. and sort of hit them all <laughs> over the house. And that was my moment. Cause there's cats everywhere. There's so many cats on that Island. Um, yeah. So that's one concrete way that we applied the work of that book during the trip. <laughs> yeah, was, that was very helpful. <laughs> and and for there was um, you know uh, regular viewers of our work, whether live or or this Mason Arts at Home uh, initiative we've been doing. Uh, a lot of people who've been coming to see our Mason Players productions for many years. Just to give you a little bit of context, a few years back uh, they'll remember our production of the Laramie Project, which came out of that same type of. Uh, interview process that Moises Kaufman and the Tectonic Theater Company um, uh, created and uh, has, has had quite the life. So uh, we, we wish the same for the Tangier Island project as well. Uh, and at this point, we're going to go ahead and um, segue into the reading of these excerpts from this play in progress called Tangier Island is Sinking. Um, the three of us are actually going to be portraying some of the characters uh, in this piece. And we're going to be joined by Dylan Hares and also by Frank Robinson Jr., who is actually going to start us off in this uh, endeavor. So Frank, over to you. Around 40 million years before Tangier, toward the end of the Eocene epoch, there was massive climatic change leading to massive extinction. Maybe 35 million years before Tangier, a meteor made impact what is now the Chesapeake Bay. In the grand scheme of things, this impact and the others that happened in the Eocene-Oligocene transition didn't have much impact on the climatic change. But it is the reason Tangier Island and the Chesapeake Bay exist today. It's also, in my opinion, the reason that Tangier Island is now just years away from sinking into the Chesapeake Bay. In recent years, the media has taken quite a specific interest in Tangier, calling it America's first climate change casualty focusing on sea level rise. But Tangier men believe the island is sinking due to the natural erosion brought by the surrounding Chesapeake Bay. They're led by Uker, Mayor James Uker Eskridge of Tangier Island. He's also a commercial crabber and clearly a Trump fan. His chief concern is protecting his island from extinction. There is a western wall and a jetty on the northwest tip which protect that side of the island, but if it does not get more protection very soon, Tangier Island and its culture will be largely, arguably entirely, lost. Uker stood in front of the dock with his arms crossed. He seemed not necessarily comfortable, but definitely used to this. So what did you, um, I know you became kind of the face of the community um, a while ago. So when did that happen? And like, oops. Yeah, there we go. Well, young lady, uh, you know, we, we've had some folks, um, well, we've had folks coming out here for quite a few years doing stories on the erosion and uh, uh, the people. And um, well, <clears throat> CNN did a story here a couple of years ago. And of course, uh, they focused on the erosion and talked about climate change and uh, sea level rise. Donald Trump. 
the support that he got here. And, uh, you know, he got almost 90 percent of the vote here. <laughs> and um, well, they had before when they, when they were getting ready to leave, they, they asked me, they said, uh, you know, uh, you want to say something to the president? He might see this. I said, yeah, uh, tell him I love him like family. And anyway, someone on his staff saw the uh, uh, saw the, the, the thing and uh, and told him uh, he needed to look at it. And he did. He said, uh, you know, he told him, uh, I'm going to call that mayor. <laughs> That's my kind of guy. <laughs> now, since that initial phone call with the president, there has been basically no progress to report. There was another promise for another project to get underway at the end of 2019, but here we are in the new decade and nothing, without so much as an update. Obviously now, it's the least of the president's worries, which is a shame because hurricane season is coming, and it's difficult to say how many of those Tangier has left. You'll listen to this. <laughs> Retreating from coastlines and riversides might have once been considered unthinkable, but across the world, it's already happening. United States, Houston, New Jersey, US, the US military is at work constructing a new site for an indigenous Yupik community in Alaska that asked to be relocated after thawing permafrost beneath the village caused it to slide in the river. Oh, whoa. The Alaskan village citing climate change seeks disaster relief in order to relocate uh, about 70 feet of land a year a road away. How much does Tangier lose per year? Um. <laughs> Abel. Oh, um, uh, oh, found it, found it. Uh, this says nine acres, wait. Okay, that's 392,000 square feet. That what? What can't be right? All right, whatever. Anyway, get this. 450 people, so more or less the same as Tangier. Uh, a new village has been chosen nine miles away, and several houses are already built. And the problem is money, the Army Corps of Engineers. Corps of Engineers. It's pronounced Corps. All right, the Army Corps of Engineers has estimated that it will cost 80 to 130 million to relocate key infrastructure. They'll lose drinking water, school, and the airport by 2020. OMG, whoa. Tangier is sinking because of a dang meteor impact 35.5 million years ago. Abel, what? You heard what I said. I don't think that's true, buddy, sorry. It's true, it's from Wikipedia. Seriously, no, seriously. This is like a real science-y page. It, it must be accurate. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, that's cool. Whoa, you have a whole graveyard of tabs, dude. Yeah, my phone's got more room for a graveyard than Tangier. <laughs> Whoa, that's rude. <laughs> like work. You don't know what my work sounds like. Uh, what she said. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so back to work. Listen, usually the president with input from FEMA declares the disaster after a specific catastrophic event. The village is asking for the declaration based on a mounting damage from erosion and thawing permafrost over the past decade. Hmm. What else does it say? Uh, it's a long shot. I think it's going to lead to a very important combo that we need to be having and the... What? The federal government doesn't have policies to deal with issues like relocation. Right. Shouldn't it? Yeah, it should, considering that America was created by the relocation of people. <laughs> Dang, Tina. Just speaking the truth, y'all. I keep reading. <sighs> If there's no money to relocate the whole village together, then New Chalk residents could be forced to scatter, with some even moving 500 miles away to Anchorage. Sheesh. Ah. 
So it's not just the houses that are at stake, but community and culture. You pick language and identity. Oh. What? The ultimate decision on whether or not to declare a disaster lives with the president. New talks leaders hope to get an answer before President Obama leaves office next week. L O L. Do you think they got their answer? That's actually not funny, Abel, and unfortunately, I doubt it. Tina's right, Abel. Be smart. And I don't know whether Obama got back to them, but I know that construction did continue in 2019 by the military, and there's a huge plans to be finished with the full move by 2023, I think. You knew all of that? You didn't say anything? I wanted to see where you were going. <laughs> well, the legislation angle is interesting. It certainly is. It's ultimately what we're after. The goal, right? But how do we get the people to support this and fight for this? What Tangerian story do we tell to grab attention? Hmm. Jordan, what are you doing? Abel, hmm. what are you doing? Or deleting old tabs. I mean, this decade old feasibility study. That's what it's called? I mean, that's what they call them, but it estimated 20 to 30 million for the plan. Exactly, which would save the island and the lifestyle, which I will argue in my essay, but- I don't see why we can't do two articles on them getting the funding. Not concerned about efficiency and practicability anymore? Exactly, it crosses my moral boundary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But then again, $30 million is so much money. That's, that's more money than I could ever right. dream to have but in my need... lifetime. Oh, wait, really? I mean, yeah, that's, that's a lot. Personally, I'm aiming higher. That's great. I mean, let's be realistic about the journalism field though. Jordan. Yeah. Anyway, the government just spent a trillion dollars to boost the stock market. <laughs> well, which didn't work. So I think that they can afford 20 to 30 million. I mean, that's nothing to these people. And it's it's everything to Tangier. It's the difference between existence and destruction, I guess. But uh, you can't go with that argument because I chose that one already and we can't do the same argument, right? That's the point, Jordan? I feel like we can work on something. Oh, okay, hold on. Well, well, I agree. Different topics would be, well... Go on. Different topics would be best, but... But? And? I think it would be okay if Tina went with this, as in switched, because she has lots of passion for it, but let me be clear. I don't think switching at this point is a good idea. Well, as an adult, I can decide for myself, and I have. And the overall stories of the articles have to be different. Yes. So, God, this is so dumb. Oh my God, Abel, act your age. He's just scared. Of that your, argue, your article is gonna be so much better than mine. Yeah, well. Abel, I'm sure your article will be fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. No hard feelings? Yeah, sure. But you're gonna help me with mine, right? Oh, for sure. <laughs> if there's any questions that you don't wanna answer, just say that you don't wanna answer and that's okay. All right. I, I don't think I'll come across many of them, but we'll see. They get different every time. <laughs> um, so when did you start doing photography? Uh, I started doing photography, uh, I guess, back like f like four years ago. I, I mean, in the beginning, I wasn't really doing much with it. I was just, um, you know, taking pictures here and there. But when I was crabbing on the water, uh, the one I worked for, a hearty son-in-law, uh, started working for him. And it resulted in me and my other classmate, which was the other mate, uh, having to split half the time. So I said, uh, I got to make up for the two weeks that I'm not on the boat. So I just started selling. Now you're on picnic tables, got bigger and bigger. And, and I opened up this. And uh, But uh, I guess I've been selling pictures like two and a half, three years. But hopefully it'll keep getting bigger. <laughs> we'll see. Did you, um, uh, did you like always like taking pictures with your phone or? 
I, I honestly, I can't remember when I actually got into it the most, but I'm always, <laughs> because everything in my childhood, it seems like I put it somewhere and then it was disappeared. <laughs> like these bottles and all, I remember finding them as a kid. And, but now that I got older and I'm like, where did I even put them? <laughs> I think I just found them, but just threw them somewhere. But I, I, I no, I, I think I've always liked taking pictures and uh, I wish I had started a lot sooner than I did. Because a lot of the stuff I remember is kids washed away. A lot of people, you, you know. Now I take a lot of pictures of the older people because they're not necessarily going to be here as long. So I wish I'd taken pictures of the old people more when I was growing up. But, uh, but I'm just glad I got into it when I did because there's not many people really capturing the way of life here. And I'm trying to do it at least to an extent. Yeah. Well, with everyone talking about how, like, you know, this is the island that's washing away. Does that um, like encourage you to take more pictures or? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm all, I'm going to try to get as many as I can to preserve a picture of life, you know, uh, as it was at its fullest, but um, it's also frustrating, you know, hearing that it's all going to wash away and all because, you know, it's, it's where you live. But um, I forgot about what I was talking about there. <laughs> That's okay. If you want to take a minute, we can. It's okay. I I don't think they're doing nothing. They're they're just going to go right through. Um, I forgot what we're talking about. <laughs> I've got a very short memory span, too. Well, it's a good thing you're taking pictures on. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> All right, and thank you very much for for that uh, uh, reading and, and all of us uh, for being part of this uh, the reading. Um, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Zach and Rebecca to stay on screen with me for these uh, few final questions um, before we wrap up for the day. Um, so um, there, there were a lot of things in that script that um, uh, are very scary <laughs> in terms of the situation. Uh, one thing in particular was uh, there was actually a reference to the situation as it would probably be in the year 2020, which of course, here we are. Um, so, um, I, you know, I guess my question is, is how bad is it? I mean, just uh, you've been keeping tabs on this, I would assume, uh, as part of your research. Um, have there been any updates since these excerpts that we just read in terms of things that the audience should be aware of? Um, I mean, uh, do you mean in terms of, of the current, you know, the current climate, or the current, uh, sort of, yeah, well, I get the current ecological climate down at Tangier Island in particular, I don't, I don't like know how, how much worse has it gotten since this. Yeah. 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 Well, so, go ahead, Zach. Sorry. You go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I don't know any exact numbers offhand, but I know that it's not getting better. Um, when we were there, we were really lucky that we got to meet um, an author named Earl Swift, who we are huge fans of. Um, yeah. Look right here. Um, so we wrote <laughs> a really remarkable book called Chesapeake Requiem um, after spending a year with them. I mean, we were impacted after five days. I can't even imagine spending a year there. Um, anyway, so we were lucky enough that we, a person we connected with while we were there was the principal of the school, Dr. Nina Pruitt, who was super helpful to us. And um, there's only one school, only K to 12 public school in the state of Virginia um, on the island. Anyway, so we went to an event at the church that night and she said hi to us and was very excited to let us know that Earl Swift is here. Uh, so she pushes us over to meet him. Um, and one of the things that he said to us in a conversation, like a private, um, a, in a conversation with us that was really impactful to me was that you know, everyone's saying that there's 75 years, we've got 75 years to fix this thing. But that study came out five or six years ago at this point. Mm -hmm. And really, it was not the most accurate study. It was very optimistic. And so really, it's more like 25, 50. And what did Earl say, Zach? What was his number? Um, Earl's, I mean... I don't, oh, wanna, I, like, I don't want to quote him, but Earl's was probably like 10, 15, 25. I, I remembered what he said. I remembered what he said. Now it just came to me. So 75, 50, or one good hurricane. Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah. like, 
when we left, I mean, that was something that I couldn't stop thinking about. And like right. every time that there was a hurricane this fall, Zach and I would just be texting each other like, oh yeah. my God. <laughs> and I, I mean, I remember uh, right after we left, I think Rebecca, you kept on saying like, I just keep on thinking like, oh, I, I wanna know when the next time I'm going back is. But right. the thing is that how do you know if you're ever going to go back? Because right. you know it might not be there by the time you get the chance, and uh, that's just a really scary thought. Yeah, that's that sort of segues into the next question I was about to ask, which is, you know, what is next uh, for this this play in terms of the research, in terms of the development of it? Are you doing workshops of the existing material? Um, uh, I know that there is a, a scheduled uh, staged reading for this sometime after things open back up again. We had to cancel the one that was scheduled this past March uh, because of the shutdown. Um, but uh, Zach, what is what are your next steps in terms of taking this to the next level or three? <laughs> um, <laughs> Pressure. <laughs> who knows how many levels there will be? But uh, yeah, I, I mean, my goal at this point is to just write the dang thing and. Uh, I've been sort of like chipping away at it every every few every chance that I can. I chip away at it a little bit more and, and get like a little bit deeper into the story. But um, because of the the master's program on I'm on, um, I've had you know some time that's just it's just impossible to to work on it. But um, yeah, my my goal is to just keep going. I have a, a very solid understanding of the overall. Um, like story structure and story arc for the fictional characters. And um, uh, and I have uh, a really good idea, I think, of how the play will continue in terms of um, the mix of that story with all of the verbatim stuff that we're including, like the interviews, lots of articles. I'm also including some communication I've had about Tangier with people through messages and emails. Um, so it's very, very much like found footage, but just found anything mm -hmm. um, going into this play for now. Um, and then I'm just gonna cut away to to sculpt it to what it needs to be. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest thing on my, in my brain right now is do I, do I try to adapt to the world and, and let the world influence this play to be something that can be experienced legitimately as a virtual audience member? Or do I write this play as something that is is gonna be able to be fully experienced as a, um, a physical audience member uh, at some point? And I think the the great thing about the direction I've already started to go in is that uh, I can be experimental. I can try and do both things, and that's that's basically what I'm going for. Yeah, and and that you you keep getting ahead of me in terms of my prepared questions. And that <laughs> Sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is actually a question for both of you. This is my final question, um, the interview, um, which is um, what response to the environmental issues do you hope to see or prompt when audience members eventually do see this play, whether it's a stage reading or ultimately a full production? What do you hope they're going to walk away with? Um, yeah, it's it's hard, right? Because like another feeling that I had after this experience was, um, and I hate to say this, but a sense of inevitability of the impact of climate change because it you can build a seawall and it will slow the progress, but the right storm is the end, and that is true of anywhere. I mean, it was practically true of New Orleans and that could be New York, that could be DC, it could be any of these coastal, like the Outer Banks almost got wiped out last year. Um, and so I think that like something that's challenging for me is what the call to action is. Um, and I think that the way that Zach ends up sculpting the play will hopefully help inform that for me. But for me at this point, like what I want people to understand that I now understand in a way I didn't before is that this is real and it's coming. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Any, any final comments from you, Zach, on that topic? Um, I mean, I just think, you know, Rebecca's completely right. Uh, 
I think for me, the biggest thing is um, in the play uh, through the, the, the three main fictional characters, Jordan, Abel, and Tina, um, the three of them will sort of uh, map out the, the biggest different directions that we could go in, in terms of trying to save the island and, and or the culture. Right. All right. We could prolong everything and, and just who knows what's going to happen. They'll yeah. figure it out in the play. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you very much for joining us today uh, in, in this uh, session. Um, I also want to extend our thanks to Dylan Harris and uh, Frank Robinson Jr. for joining us on screen. Um, and uh, it was a fantastic conversation. Um, uh, for those of you viewing, uh, this virtual reading gave us a taste of this piece, but um, those of you, at least in the Fairfax, Virginia area, will get a chance to see the rescheduled staged reading of Tangier Island is Sinking sometime next year. Once we get that scheduled, we will get word out to everybody, including those of you who are in the process of uh, creating the piece. <laughs> <laughs> um, we want to also thank the Friends of Theatre at Mason for your ongoing support of our work, uh, the Mason Arts at Home uh, digital initiative for hosting us, and especially the estate of Linda E. Gramlich for the support of the Alumni Artist Support Initiative. Uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in, and please stay safe. Thanks. Thanks.